Well, good morning. My name is Lisa Jones. I'm the pastor of adult ministries here at Christ Church of the Valley. And truly, it is a privilege to get to share with you on this special day. Um, today, we are concluding a study on the book of Ruth. And it's about an amazing woman of faith and the relationship she has with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Well, I know something about mother-in-laws because I, this summer, Brian, my husband, and I will celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary, which means I, in addition to loving my mother-in-law a lot, I actually know her pretty well. Um, I think we have a picture here of Brian and his mom. When she was with us recently, she stayed with us for about a month. And she had um, gotten to our house and she'd only been with us for a few hours and I realized she didn't show up just for a visit. She was mama on a mission. You see, after about four days of her being with us, I couldn't like bite my tongue any longer. And I turned to my husband and I said, you know, it's really a good thing. Your mom has come to stay with us because I had no idea that you are 100% perfect. Like you literally can do no wrong. And he was like, I know, isn't it cute? And I was like, yeah, for you. I'm not exaggerating. If we disagreed about anything, she would take his side. So one evening, we were about to sit down to dinner and it was a little tense because earlier that afternoon, we had had a robust conversation. You see, Many of you know that we have gotten chickens. And um, we had these chicks, and they had finally gotten big enough that they could move out of my kitchen, thank the Lord, and into their chicken coop. And, and I'm just gonna pause and say, if you've ever wanted to know what a midlife crisis looks like, look at Brian and his chickens. <laughs> because, because he has ring cameras. You know what those ring cameras are, right? He has ring cameras set up in the chicken coop. And I should film this so you don't think I'm lying, because I'm not. At night, in bed, he gets on his phone and he talks to the chickens through the ring camera. And he's like, good night, ladies. You look so pretty. I love you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's lost it. Okay, back to Meadow. So here, here back to the story. So. Chickens, finally outside. The dog, our dog Meadow, is like, wait a minute, the chickens are now all outside. And she couldn't get to them. We had her behind the gate. She's losing her mind. Like barking, crying, whining, scrape, like scrapping and pushing at the gate. And finally, I was like, this isn't fair to her. Like the chickens will be fine. Brian's like, no, she's gonna kill the chickens. I'm like, she's not gonna kill the chickens. They're behind a steel gate. It'll be fine. So I let the dog out. And this is a little bit of what that looked like. <laughs> you saw there how the chickens, as soon as she went over, they're like, they're squawking, they run into their coop. Well, the first time she did that, it was way worse than that. And they were, we couldn't catch her. So well, Brian comes running out of the house screaming, why'd you let the dog out? I told you not to let her out. She's gonna kill the chicken. She's gonna give him a heart attack. And then he says a few more things. <clears throat> so by the time we sit down to dinner, we sit down to dinner and he said, I just need to apologize. I should not have, his mom interrupts. You don't need to apologize. You were just stressed. You were worried about the chickens. And I'm sitting there like, yes, he does need to apologize. Trust me. Did you hear what he said? Um, so anyway, like I said, I know my mother-in-law really well. I love her a lot. And I think it's really fitting that today we are looking at this relationship between Ruth, the daughter-in-law, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, because there's actually a lot we can learn from them. So no matter where you are on your faith journey, there are three things that I think that we can learn from this relationship. But let's back up and make sure we're all on the same page. The story of Ruth and Naomi begins when Naomi and her husband Elimelech, he's the patriarch of the family, 
Na Elimelech and Naomi, they move out of Bethlehem. They move out of Bethlehem because there's a famine. And they move to a land called Moab. Well, in the Old Testament, it said God detested the, Moab the Moabites because they followed the God of Shamash, the God, a false God, who was the God of child sacrifice. And so they knew Elimelech should not have taken his family there, but he did. And the boys are older, they get married, and of course they marry Moabite women. And then Elimelech, the, the father of the family, he dies. And then things go from bad to worse because then each of the sons die. And Naomi is left as a widow. Her one daughter-in-law goes back to live with her family, but Ruth says, no, I I'm gonna stay with you. And this is the first thing that we can learn. Healthy relationships require trust. You see, when Ruth was also left as a widow and penniless, destitute without anything, she convinced her mother-in-law, Naomi, that they needed to stick together, that they would be better off if they stayed together. And this is where we see in the book of Ruth, one, a famous passage from the Old Testament, Ruth chapter one, verse 16, where Ruth says to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And from this passage, I think we can just learn two things right from this verse. First of all, we see, we learn that Ruth clearly had converted. She no longer ascribed to the religion of her family. She was no longer following the God of Chamash. She said, my God, the Lord. So she has become a follower of the one true God, Yahweh. And then the other thing we see here is her unshakable love and commitment to Naomi. Ruth pledges her faithfulness. So after that plea, Naomi concedes and decides to trust Ruth. And together, they return to Bethlehem, but without anything, as widows. And in that day, if you were a widow, you were pretty much relinquished to poverty. So when they get back to Bethlehem, Ruth begins picking grain in a, in a field, out of a field of a man named Boaz. She was what was called a gleaner. A gleaner was someone who was allowed to go in behind the farmers and get the scraps, whatever was left after the farmers had gone and, and harvested everything. Well, after some time of Ruth working in the fields, Naomi launches into Operation Matchmaker. How many of you like to play matchmaker? Yeah, I do too. Well, when I was in college, um, I had a friend who liked to play matchmaker. In fact, she played with me. And um, when Brian and I were friends, I think today young people call it talking. I swear the talking stage lasts forever nowadays. I say that they go from talking to being engaged. But anyway, we were in what, was what we called the friends. We were friends. And then um, we, if you were serious with someone, we would say you were going together. Do any of you remember that phrase, going together? Thank you. So a friend of mine said, Lisa, I heard that Brian might ask you to go with him. And I was like, hmm. And she said, you know, he's really cute. I think a lot of people think he's cute. Don't you think he's cute? And I was like, eh. <laughs> Maybe, but he's pretty arrogant. <laughs> and um, that was before I understood that, you know, people who are introverts, sometimes they can be really shy and reserved, and that can come across as like aloof and arrogant. But anyway, back to Naomi. Because Naomi isn't playing. She isn't playing matchmaker. She like wins the prize, OG matchmaker, because she basically says to Ruth, trust me, here's what you gotta do. You've been staying with me for way too long. You know that field that you've been gleaning in? Well, it belongs to Boaz. And Boaz is actually a distant relative of ours. In fact, I think he could be a kinsman redeemer. So here's what I want you to do. Now, I don't know about you, but how do you react when someone says, trust me? <laughs> For me, like my antenna goes up. 
And I'm immediately on guard, like, oh, what's gonna happen? What are they gonna say? But that's what Naomi basically does. She's like, she says to Ruth, trust me. I know how men operate, and this is what you're gonna do. And last week in chapter three, we learned that Naomi like lays out this list. Like, she's tough. She's like, number one, take a bath. You've been working out in that field. You're sweaty, you're smelly, you're dirty. Number two, you're gonna put on your best perfume. None of the cheap stuff. Break out the French eau de parfum. Number three, put on your best dress. Honey, when you go down there, you need to look good. And then four, she says, you're gonna walk down to the threshing floor where all the men are. Boaz will be there because they've just brought in the grain. And five, when you, after you, um, I want you to pay attention to him eating. And after he's finished eating and drinking, six, pay attention. Notice where he lies down. And seven, after he lies down, you're gonna go over and uncover him and lie down next to him. What? <laughs> I would have been like, you want me to do what? This is like next level mother-in-law boundary crossing bossiness. And I've already established that I can only hold my tongue for so long. So I think I probably would have responded a little differently than Ruth. I probably would have been like, okay, Miss Naomi, enough's enough already. I already left my family, I left my country, I followed you to Bethlehem, I picked up the, uh, this great career as a grain gleaner, and now you want me to do what? Are you kidding me? No, I can't do that. Well, despite what appears to be a, a preposterous list of things that Naomi had requested of Ruth and told her to do, Ruth responds differently, better. Out of faithfulness to God and because she trusted Naomi, Ruth said to Naomi, whatever you say, I will do. And she did it. And sure enough, Boaz chose to redeem her. And Naomi was like, yes, I told you so. But that's not where the story ends. It's not time to throw the engagement party and call the wedding planner yet because Boaz is not first in line to be the guardian redeemer. And he believes that God's laws are meant for our protection and our provision. And that's the second thing I want us to look at here. Now, how many of you are a self-described rule follower? Yeah, I see some hands going up. You're rule followers. You are the kind of people you will not walk on the grass, sidewalks only for you, please. Um, we rule followers, we walk in the crosswalk. We're not gonna cross the street unless we're in the crosswalk. If someone offers us a piece of gum and we see that it's their last piece, you gonna take it? No, 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 would never dream of it, right? And then if you use the last of the toilet paper, you wouldn't dream of leaving the bathroom without completely refilling it. So we know what rule followers are like, but those of us who are rule followers, do you know someone who kind of thinks that the rules are good, but they don't really apply to them? They genuinely think that rules are pretty much for everybody else? Now I could stop here and I could unload some stories. But it's Mother's Day, so I'm gonna ask you to help me abide by the ultimate mom rule. If you don't have anything nice to say, <laughs> don't say anything at all. But I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy who thinks that uh, rules are really just suggestions, especially certain road signs. And uh, <laughs> stop sign, tap the brakes, rule through, if no one's around. Um, but not Boaz. Boaz was a rule follower, like type A, by the book, rule follower. And even though he wanted to be the kinsman redeemer, he admitted that he wasn't first in line. And last week, Brian um, talked about what a kinsman redeemer was back in the Old Testament. If someone was widowed, a, dist or a relative, the next in line relative, male, would marry that widow so that the family would not be left destitute. And Boaz is willing to do that, but he's not first in line. So here's what he does. And this is where we pick up the story in Ruth chapter four. 
Meanwhile, Boaz went to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said to him, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, or then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative, Elimelech. Now here's what I want you to notice. Boaz does this by the book. He handles it delicately with honesty and integrity. So he calls over Mr. First in Line, Redeemer guy, over to the town gate. And back in ancient times, all of the business, the official business of the town was conducted at the town gate, similar to courthouses today. And, um, but Boaz being by the book, he doesn't just call over the first in line, Mr. First in line, because he could have just been like, hey, you know, Ruth, she, you, you can be her guardian redeemer. They've got this land. He doesn't do it that way. He calls him over, and he also calls over 10 of the elders as witnesses. He's a stand-up guy. He's also smart. So he sets the stage. He didn't want to risk losing Ruth, so he knows he can't appear too eager, right? So he explains the situation to Mr. First in line in chunks. Presentation is everything. So this is what he says next to Mr. First in line, redeemer guy. He said, I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know for no one has the right to do it except, except you. And I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Boaz is sweating a little bit, but he's a sharp guy. So he knows how to play his cards. And he initially, remember, he just initially said that there's this land for sale. So now he goes on and says to first in line redeemer guy, he said, and by the way, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth. You know, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. In other words, just in case, buddy, you have forgotten the Levitical law, what the responsibility of a kinsman redeemer is, let me just refresh your memory. And when he did, the kinsman redeemer said at this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it for yourself, I cannot do it. So once Mr. First in Line Redeemer guy realizes that this business proposal, this transaction is more than just land, but also a wife from Moabite or Moab and her mother-in-law, he goes from sold to, eh, that's a hard pass. I can't do it. Not gonna do it. You buy the land. And we've probably all done something similar, right? You go into a store, you see something, you're like, yeah, I want that, that looks great though. And then you try it on or you even look up online, you read the reviews, and then you're like, eh, I'm gonna have to pass. So what Mr. First in Line Redeemer guy is really saying is, yeah, I'd like to have the land, but you, you take it because you can take that and redeem our dead relative's wife because I don't want the responsibility of being a kinsman redeemer. You want it, you can have it. Just a little over a year ago, our middle daughter, Chandler, got married. And shortly before her wedding, uh, she and her fiance, Brent, came up for Thanksgiving. Well, at the end of the holiday weekend, um, we're out in the driveway, we had packed up the car, and Brian goes to hand Chandler some money for the road. And Brent, her fiance, said, no, I I've got it, she's my responsibility now. And I was like, whoa. And Brian was like, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, Brian's like, well, in that case, I've got her cell phone bill and her car insurance that I am ready to offload. Brent didn't crack a smile. He said, done, send him to me. And Brian, and Brian was like, okay, she's got a few student, you know, law school loans. We'll, we'll square up after the wedding. <laughs> Ladies, if you're single, and you're dating someone who just wants your field, 
but he doesn't want the responsibility of being in a God-honoring, committed relationship with you. He is not your Boaz. And single men, if you're with someone and she just wants what's in your field and she doesn't want the committed responsibility of being in a devoted relationship to you, she is not your Ruth. As adults, we know that laws are in place for a good reason, to keep people safe, establish order, to prevent chaos. But somehow that same logic oftentimes gets thrown out the window when it comes to matters of faith. I can't tell you how often I hear people say that they think if they become a Christian, they're gonna surrender their fun card and join the boring club of people that just follow a bunch of rules of do's and do nots. And I wanna tell you that is not the case at all because Jesus is our redeemer. He gives us freedom. He gives us joy. Yes, we are saved by grace and we follow God's laws because they provide for us and they protect us. And this is important though. Just because we do that, it doesn't mean that everything is always going to go our way because it will not. We live in a fallen world. And there are people here today in our church family who are going through the hardest thing they've ever gone through. People who've lost their loved ones. People who've gotten a bad diagnosis of a disease or a sickness that won't go away. People who are suffering from relational pain and heartache, career challenges, financial instability, addiction that you just can't beat, difficulties with your children. You know, just like Naomi and Ruth, we can't escape pain on this side of heaven. And maybe that's you today, maybe you're like, I have kept the laws, I've played by the rules, and you're wondering, where has that gotten you? And it brings me to our third and final point. When we remain faithful, God will turn our pain into something beautiful. I believe that. I have claimed this promise over and over in my life. It comes from Romans chapter eight, verse 28. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of who? Of those who love him and are called, not according to their purpose, but according to his purpose. You know, we make mistakes. Sometimes we veer off course and when we do that, we hurt other people. And we even hurt ourselves. And sometimes terrible things happen to us that rock our world things that we don't deserve, we didn't sign up for, we have no part in. But if we stay faithful to God in a loving relationship with him, he will work out that mess for our good. But it takes some working out. And didn't we see that? We see that in the story of Ruth and Naomi. Think about it. They both lose their husbands. They're both widows. Naomi, she loses both of her children. They have to scrounge for food. And despite their frustration, their bitterness, they remain faithful to God. And God keeps working for their good, the good in their lives. Look what happens next. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman, the women, meaning the women around in Bethlehem, the women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. I love how scripture, first of all, if anybody says that the Bible's boring, they've never read it. But I love how scripture here in the book of Ruth paints the picture of what family life and society is like 
in ancient times. Because what we see here are the women coming around Naomi, cheering her on, going, Naomi, look, you have a redeemer now. Life was terrible. You went through tragedy. You didn't deserve it. But look what, look what happened to you. But look, life can be good again. God is good. He's redeemed you. Through this child, you are going to have new meaning, a new purpose. And they're like, and what is really remarkable, especially in ancient times, is they said, look, you have a daughter-in-law. She's better than seven sons. She loves you. And then here, I love this beautiful picture that we see. Naomi then, after that, picks up the child and holds him and cares for him. Naomi picks up the child and drops her bitterness. She lets go of the resentment and the pain, and she accepts the redemption. That is beautiful. You know, there's someone here in our faith community who has a modern day redemption story. Her name is Patty. Patty is one of the directors at Liberty Ministries. Liberty Ministries is an organization here in our community. You're probably familiar with it. They support and share the gospel of Christ with people behind bars, prisoners, and also they help rehabilitate people once they have, um, they're no longer incarcerated. Well, Patty came across this career through some pain. And when she came to Surf Fest, when we were packing the uh, Lydia bags up for one of our Surf Fest Surf Fest projects, Patty, Patty shared her testimony and I was blown away. It was so powerful, I asked her if she would share it with you. Take a look at Patty and her story. Do you really believe that God works all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose? Well, I'm here to tell you that he does. When I was 17 years old, my dad murdered his wife and committed suicide. This totally wrecked me. I felt unloved, rejected, and just went into a complete depression. I didn't know how to process my feelings, and I didn't know how to deal with the pain. So eventually, I chose heroin to deal with that. That heroin uh, led me to a life of addiction and eventually crimes. One day, I was driving a stolen vehicle, which led me to a high-speed police pursuit and I was driving 100 miles per hour down the Roosevelt Expressway, facing oncoming traffic. And I praise, I praise God every day that no one was hurt that day, but that was the beginning of my salvation because while I was incarcerated, someone shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me. And I know today that Jesus loves me. He is a redeeming God and he can turn a mess into a message. And I'm just here to say, that this is my mugshot from 2005. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. Seek Jesus. I love that. And I thank Patty for sharing her story because just like Patty, just like Naomi, we also have to accept the redemption that Jesus gives us. You know what's really cool about this story? When we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we can go to the book of Matthew in chapter one, and we'll find, if we read, it goes all the way back to Naomi and her family. If you're in the book of Matthew and you, where you read, this is the, ge the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And then you go down, and then it says, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Think about that. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. So after that tragedy, in just three generations, Naomi is the great, great grandmother of King David. But it doesn't stop there. It gets even better. Keep on going. And then we get down to Nathan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. The mo and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? Because, well, let me ask you this. 
Do you remember the first in line redeemer guy? The guy that didn't want to be the redeemer because it would risk his estate? He was more concerned about that than caring for his um, relatives. What's his name? We don't know, do we? <laughs> because his name is never recorded in scripture. But I bet when tragedy struck Naomi's family, she did not begin to think. She had no clue that God would do anything good out of that mess. But because Ruth chose to stay faithful and chose to trust, their genealogy leads all the way to Jesus, the Messiah, the ultimate redeemer. And now it leads to you. In Ephesians chapter one, verse seven, the apostle Paul writes, in him, him meaning Jesus, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You see, your deepest pain, your greatest regret, your sorrow, Jesus can redeem them. We all do things and say things we wish we could take back, take back and we can't because we've all sinned. Scripture tells us in Romans chapter three, verse 23, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all mess up. We may even be like Naomi and turn back. We may be like Ma Naomi earlier in Ruth where she blamed God for what happened. But even if that's you, no matter where you are in your past, I want you to know you don't have to look back any longer. You can look to Jesus, your redeemer, and accept his grace. On June 4th, we're having a baptism service. And so I just wanna encourage you, if you have not yet accepted this free gift of grace from Jesus, your redeemer, I just wanna ask you, are you stuck looking back? Are you worried that, some, that you know, you're not good enough? None of us are. Is something holding you back? Because if so, I want to encourage you to be like Ruth and boldly accept the free gift of grace. So if baptism is your next step in your faith journey, you can sign up at ccvlive.com or you can scan the QR code and put your trust in the true redeemer, the one who saves, and then live a redemptive life. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for what we learn from the story of Ruth and Naomi. Thank you for Ruth's faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for redeeming us from all of our sins. We cannot repay you. All we can do is accept it and thank you. And that is what we do today. And it's in your name that I pray, amen.